Okay, hey Darren. Hello, hello. Hello everyone who's doing this long. long. <laughs> How are you doing, Darren? Um, <laughs> same old. <laughs> yeah. See my screen, right? Yep, yep. And, uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Friday Hacks. Uh, thanks for taking time out on a Friday evening to, to join us this week. Um, so today we'll have two talks as usual. Uh, and for the first talk, we have Ankita from Stripe, who will give us a look under um, the hood of Stripe.js. So Ankita is, uh, works as a software engineer at Stripe, building um, global payments infrastructure. And she enjoys working on both front-end and back-end technology as part of her work. Um, and her interests involve web development, distributed systems, uh, data pipelines, and infrastructure management. So um, without further ado, please uh, join me in, uh, in welcoming uh, Ankita, who will give us our first talk. Um, hang on, let me stop sharing my screen and then Ankita, you can take over. Yep. Uh, cool. Let me start sharing my screen. All right. Uh, okay. I hope that's looking fine. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, Daryl already uh, gave a short introduction, but uh, just to sort of uh, uh, talk about a few things about uh, what I'm uh, a few few notes on what I'm working on at Stripe uh, is like essentially building out the global infrastructure uh, at Stripe and let's sort of dive into what that really means and what Stripe does because I wouldn't assume that all of you are familiar with uh, uh, what exactly Stripe does right and um, Stripe is essentially a company that powers uh, internet businesses and especially from the payment side and so at the core of Stripe's offerings is a global payments and treasury network, which essentially is a way of saying, uh, being able to programmably move money around. And that means that we are able to use APIs to accept payments, to pay out to our users, uh, and to do all the sort of adjacent things or the adjacent responsibilities that come with handling money, essentially. Uh, and so for every country that we are in, we like to introduce local payment methods for that particular country uh, that the users are most used to paying in. So I believe a lot of you are in Singapore, have been in Singapore at some point, and you probably know that, you know, we have a few payment methods here. One commonly used one is credit card, but there are also local payment methods like um, uh, using, let's say, some wallets like GrabPay or like using your DBS Payla or using net banking. And uh, to be present globally and to handle payments basically means being able to accept money through all these different sources that uh, users in a particular country are most comfortable paying with and being able to send that money to the merchants accounts and allowing them to sort of, uh, you know, pay out that money to their own bank account in a currency that they sort of want that uh, money to be paid out in. And uh, the way uh, we think about this entire problem is that we think about it as like an abstraction of a lot of complexities. And so uh, what you have as the primary user of Stripe is a merchant or a seller who is trying to, um, you know, presumably is one of your internet businesses that is trying to sell items online. And in the process, one of the steps that they do, they need to go through is to accept payments. And as customers of like various online websites, payments always seems like this really tiny part of my purchase. So I spend a lot of time like browsing through the website and then probably just like sort of accept uh, payment by a credit card and get done with it. And it seems like a rather small part, but uh, every single time there's a payment involved, there's a lot of complexity that goes on under the hood. Uh, so for instance, uh, you have a whole bunch of different credit cards uh, or payment methods. So you have uh, various cards and payment methods that are popular in each country that we just spoke about. 
Uh, and payments is a heavily regulated space. So uh, every time you want to accept credit cards, you want to be careful about handling that credit card information well, uh, because it is sensitive information. It is user data that is subject to uh, a lot of fraudulent uh, you know, transactions and a lot of uh, uh, scrutiny goes into how the data is stored. Um, in addition, uh, you know, we just spoke about, oops, uh, we just spoke about fraud. So there is possibilities of fraud where uh, maybe less so in Singapore, uh, but you know, it is common for credit cards to get stolen. It is common for stolen credit cards to get used. And when that happens, uh, a customer will typically write into the bank and say, this is not a payment that I made. Uh, and that sort of accounts for a chargeback. How do you as a merchant handle that? Um, that is also a part of the complexity of handling payments. And uh, while these cases seem like edge cases, they actually happen fairly commonly, especially depending on the country that you're accepting payments in. And then finally, uh, you know, there's international expansion, which is uh, use cases such as I am a customer who's sitting in Singapore and I want to order something from a uh, merchant who is selling things in the US. And maybe, maybe what I want to do is I want to pay with my uh, wallet. Like, let's say I have GrabPay credits and I somehow this merchant accepts GrabPay and I can pay with my GrabPay credits and uh, have this merchant deliver the product to me and be paid out in a currency of their choice, which is US dollars. So how do you make that kind of, uh, you know, routing of uh, pay ins and pay outs happen and happen in very, very heterogeneous kind of uh, payment methods, essentially. Uh, so that is also something if you want to be a seller who is essentially global and you want to sell to customers across the world, you want to think about that. And while GrabPay sounds like a like not such a great example, but you can imagine that there are countries where uh, a certain payment method is extremely popular, but it's only local to that country. And that's where some of these things become uh, quite important. So uh, on that note of abstracting complexities, uh, Stripe tries to do that abstraction for the merchants. Uh, so you have essentially the merchant that talks to Stripe via Stripe's APIs, and these APIs are handling everything, right? So they are handling fraud detection. So if a credit card is uh, diagnosed as fraudulent, maybe these APIs will tell the merchant that this transaction looks suspicious and you know will alert them, and that way they will not ship the goods uh, to a credit card transaction that looks uh, fraudulent. Uh, likewise, uh, let's say if you want to, you know, transact using a particular local payment method, these APIs will make it possible to do that and will make it look fairly like a, you know, whether you're using a credit card uh, transaction or you're using a wallet, everything would look like a uniform sort of an interface that is exposed by these APIs. Uh, and so on, so on and so forth, right? So all the things that we discussed in the previous step could be complexities that can be abstracted away. Um, so on that note of international expansion, this is a photo from uh, Stripe's uh, launch in Malaysia. And uh, uh, the reason I'm sharing this photo is because this particular launch was a, a rather big uh, launch for us. And it was essentially a very important part of this launch was to be able to offer local payment methods for Malaysian users. And for those of you who have lived in Malaysia or are familiar with the Malaysian payment scene, uh, while credit cards hold an important place for online transactions, there's a fair bit of uh, consumers who actually want to use bank-based payment methods. Uh, and one of these popular ones in Malaysia is called FPX. And so this particular uh, launch was essentially at the point where we were able to go into Malaysia with both credit cards and the local payment method FPX. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, what exactly is FPX. Uh, uh, and I know that some of you might be wondering where is the, you know, the, the Stripe JS pieces, and those will come in, I assure you. Um, so firstly, let's understand what FPX is, and then a lot of the things around why it's complex will make sense, and then also how we handle that complexity will also make sense uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, so FPX is, imagine a, a bank-based payment method in Singapore. It could be paying via your internet banking. Uh, and it is the equivalent of that in Malaysia, except you have about 13 banks that are participating in this, and you can choose any bank of choice that you bank with. And when you click on this, you are redirected to the bank's authentication page. And on this page, you will essentially authenticate using the bank's credentials, right? And so all the OTP devices, et cetera, uh, that the bank provides would be required to authenticate to your bank account 
And then in that bank, once you're logged in, you will basically see a sort of a page that says, hey, do you want to authorize this transaction? Uh, you know, and if you say yes, that's when you get redirected back to the merchant. So it's like a redirect based payment method where you first get redirected to the bank site and then you get redirected back to the merchant. And then in between, you sort of authorize the payment or you may reject the payment uh, if you know you haven't actually made the payment and and you know that 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 needs to be handled as well. Um, so this entire process of integrating with FTX, so remember our diagram previously, which is you essentially have to put yourself in the shoe of a merchant, shoes of a merchant, and think about what would it mean if you wanted to uh, be sitting in Singapore and offer a product to Malaysian users and allow Malaysian users to pay via FTX, because if not, then you probably are missing out on a huge set of the target market that you're trying to sell to. Uh, and, um, you know, having like sitting in Singapore, you probably, you know, are le not su super aware of what the regulatory landscape in Malaysia is. Uh, what does it take for you to onboard to this payment method called FTX? Like what are the documents that you need to provide to be uh, able to prove to FTX that you are a legitimate seller? Um, and then uh, how do you do these redirects to these banks? What are these banks and what are their, you know, login pages? Do you keep track of all of that on your website? Uh, and then most importantly, like once, let's say you have integrated with it, uh, with these banks, given that these are banks that require login, you probably need to hold an account with each of these banks. So imagine a situation where, well, quite, uh, I mean, you know, imagine a situation where you don't have an account with a bank, which seems quite likely, right? Uh, and if that happens and you wanted to essentially test your integration, how would you do that? How would you make sure that uh, you can log into the bank and if you authorize the transaction, everything just goes through. So basically that end-to-end -end process of having FPX working is essentially challenging for a merchant who has very little context about this payment method. Um, and so we wanted to provide like a experience where Stripe comes in and Stripe handles FPX much like the other payment methods that a merchant is integrated with like credit card. Uh, and all the merchant needs to do is specify maybe as an API argument that what they wanna use is FPX as a payment method and everything from there on is like taken care of. And so essentially not, none of the parts of the API look very different to the merchant. The merchant automatically gets redirected to the right website, uh, is automatically redirected. The customer once uh, they approve the payment are automatically redirected back to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the merchant website, right? And making that integration extremely smooth, making sure that every edge case is handled, is something that uh, would comprise a Stripe quality experience. Um, and so, uh, let's look at like it's like roughly what this looks like, right? And so, from a product experience, because the product experience essentially defines how we should technically handle that problem. And so, from product experience we want to have a really good onboarding and testing environment. And so we like have a dashboard that, you know, we sort of merchants can log into and then uh, these merchants can then activate their FTX uh, payment method using this dashboard. Uh, so, you know, Stripe takes care of what documents the merchant needs to provide. So if they need to provide a legal entity uh, a document, which proves that they have a valid legal entity, Stripe would, sort of show those requirements to the merchant in the in this page where they're activating their account or where they're uh, enabling FPX. Um, then making sure that the integration is smooth. Uh, so one thing that we talked about was how do you make sure that you test, uh, you're able to test the entire integration. Uh, one thing that we do is we offer two different um, ways of integrating. One is like a live mode payment where you actually move money. And the other is a test mode payment where you don't really move any money, but you actually go through an end-to-end -end experience. But a lot of the things that, like the, instead of the bank page, we replaced it with a simulated Stripe page, which would look uh, nothing like the bank page, but essentially will tell you that if this page gets rendered, uh, you will most likely get redirected to the bank if you were in the live mode setup. Uh, so it kind of gives merchants this confidence that without moving any money, they're able to test their integration end to end and you know, click on authorized test payment, make sure they get redirected back. And that like sort of uh, gives more guarantees around their end to end uh, integration experience. Uh, and then um, if uh, you know, y'all are interested, just you know, look up Stripe documentation API reference uh, and 
uh, one of the things that we try to do is uh, try to basically make our test environment very, very close to our live environment. And this is hard because uh, in a live mode environment, a lot of things go wrong. Uh, for example, you may have a situation where uh, the partner that you're talking to, which is FPS, they could be down. And if they're down, how do you handle that situation? How do you um, make sure that users are aware of like what exactly the API risk returns in case in case Stripe diagnoses that FPX is down? Uh, and so a lot of the, the focus in our APIs is around making sure that we are able to provide them like these special, uh, you know, magic credit card numbers, for example, that they can use to test with uh, a certain like input value that they can use uh, that once they pass in, they are able to simulate exactly like a kind of failure that they can expect to see in a production environment. And then we, sh we make sure that their API integration handles that kind of failure. Uh, and so that is also a part of the reliability in end-to-end -end testing. Uh, yeah, this is basically an example of uh, how you can pass in a different API parameter uh, to uh, Stripe's APIs and uh, always get a response that tells you that a bank is offline. And that sort of like helps you know how your integration behaves if you encounter an offline bank error. Uh, and then finally, you know, we write a lot of tests. And so tests are an important part of uh, making sure that internally we know things are handled well. And one of the things that, for instance, we also, uh, you know, try to do is to, uh, in this in this particular snippet, what you see is like a Ruby code, and the code the language doesn't matter. But the idea is that we are trying to create a FPX server, which in our in our test environment, and we are trying to sort of simulate all the behaviors of a fake FPX server in our testing, such that when we write our integration tests, we can basically um, you know set up an integration test fixture that says that hey, in this test, let's simulate a scenario where FPX is down. And now let's call this test and make sure that we get the response that we are expecting to see. We get an error response in this case. And it's the same error response that we tell our users, uh, you know, when we tell our users that you're gonna receive a status code of 402, the error response that we get in this case is also 402. And so, um, you know, we kind of like try to do that uh, Try to build that robustness into our systems, especially while we're testing it. Um, so, um, and, and then this is another example of just allowing safe retries. But uh, let me jump on to, I guess you get the point, right? So you get that, you know, there is a lot of complexity and uh, there are a lot of these APIs that Stripe provides that try to abstract this complexity from users and handles like payments related issues for these users. Uh, and as you can understand that APIs are a backend part of an integration, which means that a merchant already has a front-end website in any front-end framework, right? Maybe they have a React website or whatever, some JavaScript framework website, uh, and they still have to handle the part which is displaying a checkout page. So every single merchant website that you might have swiped your credit card at will have this little uh, placeholder where you can enter your credit card details. And that is still something that the merchant needs to do. It's only once you enter your credit card details that they send these details to the Stripe APIs. And that's where Stripe APIs then sort of takes charge of the rest of the transaction and make sure that everything else goes smoothly. Uh, but, you know, for those of you who have, you know, sort of worked on both front end and back end, uh, it isn't a overstatement to say that, you know, UI, building a good UI, building a good responsive UI is not really easy. And so uh, think about it, right? In FPX's case, what we need to do is, uh, we're gonna look at the demo really shortly about what this looks like. But meanwhile, try to imagine that you have a bank dropdown. You wanna make sure that your UI displays this dropdown well. You wanna make sure that you know this dropdown is displayed both on uh, mobile web as well as a web browser. Uh, the UI redirects the user correctly, uh, or maybe Stripe's APIs take care of that. So at least you wanna make sure that the UI is displayed correctly. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of things, like you wanna show that uh, these banks have like, you know, uh, FPX has a certain set of regulations where if you show, if you integrate with FPX, you have to follow a bunch of standards. Like you need to show the right icons for the bank. How do you get the right icon? So as a front-end developer, now you're thinking about getting the right icon images, getting your designer to edit those images and make sure that you show them on your website. And so uh, there essentially is a lot of complexity that comes in beyond 
just API integration, even on your UI side. And this is where uh, we have Stripe Elements. Uh, and Stripe Elements is essentially a JavaScript library, uh, or rather powered by this library called Stripe.js, which is Stripe's JavaScript library that lets users handle or you know also delegate the responsibility of showing responsive uh, elements to on their website uh, using this library right so they don't now have to worry about having this form where users need to enter credit card information and likewise for fpx uh, have like a placeholder where users need to enter their bank information uh, and so i think like the the first question that i think is worth asking is why is uh, beyond making uh, a front-end developer's job easy, is there any other purpose these elements serve? And uh, this is where uh, uh, I'd like to allude to the point that I brought up earlier, which is that payments is a highly regulated space. And if you are a website that is accepting credit card numbers, for example, you are essentially subject to this regulation, which is called PCI, which means that it has lots of components, but one of the key components is that uh, unless you're PCI compliant, you're not allowed to store credit card numbers on your own server, which means that uh, if you wanted to store these numbers on your server, uh, you need to essentially go through a very, very dif difficult regulation or a very difficult audit process. Uh, and so that is some sort of a, like if you're a small merchant that's just setting up shop, you probably don't want to go through that entire process. and uh, you know, as as that merchant, as like if you put yourself in the shoes of that merchant, you would want somebody else to handle credit card numbers safely because all you care about is that money reaches you. Uh, and so elements go beyond making a front end developer's job easy, but they also abstract other complexities around payments from our users. And and we will look into the example of how the elements work for FPX and why, uh, you know, what is the sort of underlying uh, JavaScript that goes into it. Uh, but before that, let me switch over to a demo. And for that, I will exit the presentation mode and just open this particular demo. Um, cool. It is just going to load up in a second. And I think this will give you a better idea of, of like uh, what the FTX element looks like. So um localization right this is a malaysian payment method so a lot of the the words that you see here are in bahasa malay and uh you know this is also one of those things that uh, as a small merchant you don't want to think about translations that much and so this is what uh is handling you know that that stuff for you uh when you click on this drop down you see a bunch of banks and you see that okay you can essentially you see the logo for the bank you see the name of the bank, uh, you can click on it. And then you also see like this word called Loar Talia, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but essentially it means that the bank is offline. And this is a real time status that we are getting from FPX's APIs, uh, where when we call FPX, FPX tells us that this particular bank is offline. And so if the user tries to uh, proceed with their payment with this bank, they are gonna likely fail. And so we show this information to the users as well. Uh, so we will just pick up one of the banks that is online, and then I will essentially say pay with pay uh, fifty point nine nine, right? And this is the test mode page that I was talking about, where essentially uh, this is a Stripe hosted page, where what you're seeing is you know this is a test payment page, which would likely show up once a user essentially is trying to simulate the point where the user enters their login details in a bank, and in a bank's uh, internet banking page, they see this kind of authorize the payment or fail the payment. Obviously, the bank page will look very different, uh, but without having to log in with the bank, you actually get to try what happens if you click on either of these buttons. Uh, and then you also see like what is the API response that gets created in the background, right? So because for a merchant, uh, this response could be important. Maybe they're storing some of the fields of this response. And so, uh, you know, the, these could be things that a merchant cares about. And so when you click on authorize test payments, you get redirected back to the merchant site, which essentially is the same the page that we started and you see at the merchant site, the merchant gets this entire response that we just saw. Uh, and obviously all of these responses, et cetera, could be uh, configured, but uh, all of this is powered by Stripe elements. And uh, you know, this is what becomes extremely easy if you're a merchant that's using uh, an FTX element. 
So give me one moment. It's going to be a little bit clumsy, but all right. Okay. Let me see. I think you should be able to see my screen. Is that is that looking right? Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, now is the interesting thesis about what is the stripe element and how exactly does it work under you know under the hood? What is exactly is an element doing? Uh, so one one the first step is that it loads a stripe JS library, which is the JavaScript library um, the stripe has. It it has like five simple steps, and we will go through each of the steps. Uh, so I will not go through the steps on this slide, but we'll just walk through every single step first uh, to understand what. If you were a developer that was trying to add this to your website, what your experience would look like, right? And you don't actually, as a developer at this point, care about how this works as long as it shows up on your UI. So firstly, you're going to add like some JavaScript that will load Stripe.js library, and then you will create a instance of uh, Stripe by passing in a public key, which is something that you can get from the Stripe dashboard, and it's specific to your account, helps Stripe identify the merchant, which is you, and you know, assuming you're the merchant in this case who's trying to integrate, and then you get to pass in some options that we will not go in the details of, uh, but assume that there are some supported options that you know you can pass in. Uh, now that you have this sort of uh, you know instance of Stripe created, you can in the second step use that particular object. Uh, uh, you know that you got in the previous step in step one that is you can create use that object to um, create a new instance of stripe elements by just calling stripe dot elements and uh, you know this is essentially a function that's present on the object that you just created in the previous step uh, now with that instance of elements that you got you can call another function which is uh, elements dot create and you can pass in what's the type of element you're creating because essentially stripe elements can be used for a bunch of different payment methods and FPX is just one of them. So if you were trying to create a credit card uh, element where you want to enter the credit card details, uh, you know, so essentially you want like a placeholder to enter the card number, then in that case, you would probably pass in a different element name. And this is what Stripe uses in the background to know which element are you trying to render on your screen. Um, one thing that's very important is that uh, you don't want to put a UI on your page that looks like it's, you know, branded, like it has a Stripe brand or it has a brand that does not match the styling of your website. So if you are using like a set of colors and themes and fonts, you want to be able to make sure that the element on your page looks like it's a part of your website rather than it's like completely different, right? And so as a result, like you may want to pass in style and you know pass in things like font family, size, padding, etc. And these should be uh, based on what you uh, you know whatever website style works for you. And then there's another option which is FPX specific, and I won't go into the details of like what this option does, but um, it does a, uh, it's basically FPX uh, allows you to have multiple types of integration, and one of them is individual, another one is a B2B, which is a business to business integration. And so in this case, we're just talking about an individual example. So that's the third step where you now have an instance of the uh, uh, FPX bank element. Now with this particular instance, uh, for it to show up on your screen, you need to call a method called mount on it. And this is also something that is uh, a method that is on the instance of the element. And you need to pass in the div that you want to mount it in. So imagine that you just have an empty div in your HTML, which has an ID called FPX bank element. And you want to make sure that this little UI component appears inside that div. And so basically you'll call a command called mount, and then you will sort of, uh, you know, pass that. Uh, uh, so actually at this point, uh, you should already see this, this UI where you see a dropdown and you see the button is something that you will probably show up on your own website uh, because uh, you probably want to enter the value to be what is the checkout value, right? That the customer is checking out with. But you should start seeing a drop down already, and that's like at that point, like you can see, like by step four, we have a UI that's present. Now the next thing that we want to do is to make sure that when a user clicks on this button, they actually get redirected to the FPX bank page, or in, in case of test mode, they get redirected to the Stripe test mode page. 
And uh, for that to work, what you want to do is uh, add a handler, right? So you, you essentially uh, allow the users to, um, for basically what you're going to do is that on this button, you'll add an event handler, but it says that when this button is pressed, call stripe.confirm FTX payment and pass it the client secret. Client secret is something that you get when you create a payment intent uh, with Stripe. Let's not go into what that is, but essentially it's something that Stripe tells you. Uh, it gives you an argument which, is, which has a value and that value corresponds to the client secret. So you want to pass in this value and this helps Stripe determine that you are a legitimate merchant trying to make this payment. Uh, you pass in this FPX bank element, which you created in step three, right? And so you pass that in and then you basically pass in a return URL which says that, hey, once a merchant completes the payment, send them back to this particular page. And you know you can basically say that, just send them back to this same page where they started by saying window.location.href. And then uh, you can add some sort of you know, handlers which say that when this succeeds, if it succeeds with an error, handle the error. Otherwise, redirect, otherwise everything else Stripe takes care of. So in the success case, Stripe will handle the redirect to the, uh, to the FTX bank page, essentially. So at this point, you are done with the integration. So with just like a couple of lines of code, you have that entire demo that I showed to you available on your website. Uh, and so obviously all of this seems quite magical. You know, we're just like, uh, you know, writing a bunch of JavaScript that does things that seem fairly like uh, you know, seem like they have a lot of responsibility. And I think there's a natural curiosity of like, what exactly is this JavaScript doing? Uh, and so let me walk you through every single step and what happens in the background uh, with some sort of like visual representation that, you know, is essentially like morely, more, mostly a visual aid, but not like maybe like the most accurate picture of all the things that are going on. Um, so one of the things that Stripe JS and Stripe Elements rather is like based on is iframes. Um, so for those of you who are less familiar with what iframes are, iframes are essentially HTML embedded inside another uh, another web page, right? And each of these iframes can have their own uh, document element. They can have their own sort of history, browsing history and browsing context. And so it's essentially like saying that if I have a website today, I can embed maybe a you know, Google map inside that by just and you know, by just like rendering maps.google.com inside an iframe. Uh, and an iframe is important, uh, uh, or rather the reason Stripe Elements started using iframes is because, uh, for example, credit card information, Stripe is PCI regulated and Stripe can handle this credit card information and has the right sort of systems in place to make sure that the customer data is handled uh, in a way that like the regulation requires. And so if a user, renders a credit card holder in an iframe, it essentially means that they can, you know, their website does not touch the credit card number at all because the iframe actually renders a, a Stripe hosted element uh, or a Stripe hosted UI where the UI itself is actually hosted on Stripe's page and so it never really touches the merchant's page. And so that's like a little background of why iframes uh, were used initially for credit cards. Uh, but then they started like, the usage of iframes expanded to other elements uh, like FPX. FPX does not have a concept of PCI compliance, but uh, we will see in like one of the steps uh, in the following slides why uh, iframes are still useful for, for this context. And so uh, coming back to step one, essentially what happens is that when you load uh, Stripe.js and when you call, uh, you know, at the point where you load Stripe.js, you have a global variable called Stripe that is added to the window. And then, you can use that global variable to pass it in a bunch of options like the public key and you can pass it in like a, you know, a few options that are like the acceptable options. Uh, these options are useful at a later stage uh, when we call confirm FPX payment, but like they are essentially used for validation uh, for knowing like what locale you want to render this element in. So locales are as a result taken care by, and if you pass in auto, for example, in this case, then it will use the browser locale to render the right locale to our user. So localization gets handled in that way. Um, now, when you initialize uh, the Stripe global object with this public key, it essentially creates a new controller frame. A controller frame is nothing but like an iframe 
And imagine that a controller iframe's job is to keep track of all the other iframes that will get created subsequently. So it is like a coordinator of all the iframes. It knows which iframes exist. It knows, uh, you know, when a particular, it, it, it's able to sort of like handle the initialization of like various iframes and then manage the communication between these iframes. And so, so that's like sort of the controller frame. Uh, and we call it, uh, I mean, it's just called the controller because it is kind of controlling the interaction between iframes, but you can call it anything. Uh, it's just, it's just an iframe. It's not like a JavaScript, JavaScript specific concept in this case. And so you can see that it has a few variables inside it. it like it has many things going on, but in the most simplistic view, it basically uh, has like a variable that keeps track of all the iframes and it also keeps a track of its own ID, uh, you know, just, uh, just in case there are, just, just so that it's easy to communicate and recognize uh, what's, uh, which iframe is the controller iframe. Uh, and um, this controller iframe then gets appended to the DOM. So it's an invisible iframe. It does not make any UI changes to the, to the web page, but it just gets like sort of attached to the DOM. And then in the next step, we see that we are creating a new instance of Stripe elements. So at this point, the user can specify things like fonts and locales, and all of these things are loaded asynchronously. So in a way, we take care of certain performance concerns where, you know, uh, at the point where this step is called, a lot of like background things happen that essentially make it faster to render the actual UI elements once, you know, once the code hits that point. Um, and in the next step, we are passing in a certain like, you know, we're passing in like a string, which is the FTX bank, that's the identifier of the element. And then we're passing in a bunch of other options, right? So one thing that happens uh, is like the like all of these options like have maybe some validation attached to it and the controller app makes sure that these validations are done. So if you passed in something that does not quite make sense or if you somehow, let's say if we are in a stage where uh, you as a merchant, we are still in a testing stage for FPX bank, like uh, uh, or rather when we first released it, we released it only to a fixed set of merchants and these merchants were given uh, sort of a you know secret that they could pass into Stripe JS uh, that would tell us that they are the sort of merchants that have been gated in to use this you know the test integration because we don't want to make it publicly available and so it kind of does these validations to make sure that you are a merchant who has the right secret to use like this beta element right now uh, but now that it's in public stage anybody can use it and we don't do that validation but there are still a bunch of other validations that happen um, and so at this point what happens is that uh, because Stripe.js knows that you're trying to create an FPX bank element, it knows what are the iframes that FPX bank needs. And so in this case, FPX bank uh, is designed to use at least two different UI, uh, you know, UI pieces, which are each rendered in their own iframe. And we will talk about why that's the case. Uh, but the controller app will now create these two distinct iframes and it will now sort of like, you know, uh, basically assign the same group ID to each of these iframes so that there's like this parent-child relationship where uh, all of the iframes that have the same group ID are the children of this controller app. And then it will also keep track of the iframes in its like own like local state. Uh, so it also like then applies the styles to these iframes. Uh, these sty styles that are uh, passed in are assigned to the style attribute on an iframe. Uh, so once this step is done at step three, we uh, then sort of like, this is the part which was about having two different iframes. So why do we need these two different iframes? Uh, what we just saw in the demo was a dropdown, which was in a collapsed form. So imagine if you're showing that uh, on your checkout page, uh, you'll have a dropdown that's in a collapsed form. But when you click on the uh, drop down itself, you will have a list of banks. And so if the iframe itself expands automatically, uh, then all the buttons that you have below the checkout page that say like pay with X amount will all shift, right? Because the height of the iframe expanded suddenly. So this is a this is probably a workaround uh, that you know we need to have in place just because it is using iframes and we're not asking the merchants to render the actual UI, but we're just telling them render this iframe and this iframe will contain all the UI that you need. And so the way we are managing this like height shifting kind of situation is that we are height we are adding in two different iframes of which the second one, which has a dropdown is hidden at the time where the iframe, you know, the element is loaded on the page. 
And then uh, the first one is the one which shows you select bank. And only when you click on the drop down, the second one shows up. So it kind of like shows up on top of your existing uh, UI and like, you know, it kind of uh, uh, nicely overlays itself on top of your existing UI. So you don't have that experience where all your UI starts shifting down uh, and it like starts looking a little bit, you know, strange from a customer experience perspective. Um, now these two iframes actually can communicate with each other using window.post message, which is a, a way for iframes to communicate with one another. And the reason, the, the use case why they communicate with each other is because uh, the parent, or rather the main sort of primary iframe, which is the drop down, it calls a particular API, which is on hosted on api.stripe.com that loads all the offline banks, or rather loads the bank statuses from FTX. So it basically finds out whether a particular bank is online or offline and gets that list from FTX. And then it sends that payload via window.post message down to the second iframe. And the second iframe no longer makes that call independently and just uses the payload passed to it uh, and uh, you know displays whether a bank is offline or it doesn't display anything in case the bank is online. Uh, so that's, that's essentially how they communicate with each other. Uh, and then in the next step, we basically, until we hit step four, all of these things are happening in the background, but nothing shows up on the UI. So these iframes now need to be explicitly added to the user's DOM. And so, you know, to decide which, you know, exact node in the DOM does it get added to, we have a separate function that lets the user specify which sort of HTML uh, div or the ID of the, you know, DOM element uh, where we should attach this entire UI. And so at the point where a user calls this, we essentially append this entire iframe uh, uh, that was created uh, to the to the DOM. So we have a secondary iframe and a primary iframe, and so we basically append the primary iframe, and then that sort of handles the, you know, communication between like other iframes. It's a little bit confusing, but like I just wanted to share with you that you know a pretty simple concept of iframes can be used to uh, create a very very powerful user experience, uh, you know, if it's used in the right way. Uh, and yeah, and the and at this point, like we already have the UI as we had seen in the previous like slides, and so the final step is to really just uh, uh, add a handler for the button. Uh, and so at the point where the you know the button calls like uh, confirm FTX payment, which is a function on top of the Stripe JS library, and it passes in an element inside uh, because you know by passing in the element, uh, the the actual element, uh, we are able to extract the state from that element. So we are able to extract data in that element, like the, for FTX, for example, one of the data that we extract from the element is the bank name. So we're able to get the bank name out from this particular element. For a credit card, this would be the credit card details. So they never really hit the merchant side. In, instead, what happens is that Stripe just uses that particular iframe to extract all the data that was entered inside that iframe. Uh, and that's how like the merchants can escape like PCI compliance. But in FTX's case, uh, it's more of a different use case. So there's there's no PCI compliance here. Uh, and then finally, yeah, we extract the data and then the Stripe JS itself ends up calling the API that Stripe powers, which is like the, the APIs that we were talking about. Uh, so the merchant does not have to call Stripe's APIs directly because the element or the Stripe JS library already handles that. Um, yeah, so that brings me to almost the end. I think we have some more time uh, maybe for questions or maybe this is the break time, but uh, very quickly ending uh, what I just shared. Uh, if you wanted to check out these things uh, and you know you wanted to see what Stripe elements look like, uh, understand how these are built, try to integrate that for your own project or you know websites, then uh, there are like stripe.dev slash samples where you can go and check out what these little tools, uh, UI tools look like. Uh, and then some of the key takeaways would be, um, as you are thinking about designing systems or designing your own APIs, uh, try to think about it in terms of like, how do you make your API design so robust that uh, as you expand the use case of your APIs, you can still keep the complexity away, uh, abstracted away the complexity. Uh, you can basically keep the complexity abstracted away from callers, uh, even if it's just your own front-end clients, you can try to make your APIs in a way where the API can handle a lot of things uh, without letting the client bother themselves about what these things are. Uh, you can, you should try to reduce the unknowns in your APIs uh, by 
handling these unknowns, allowing your users to be, or your client to be able to, uh, you know, hit these unknowns with certain parameters, uh, you know, so, uh, for example, what we saw with the offline bank, which is a hard thing to simulate, but we do expose API parameters that allow users to get the same response. And then finally, uh, you know, focus on the test environment, like as much as you focus on production. And uh, if you try to make them as close as possible, uh, I think the quality of your integrations would be generally higher. Uh, yeah, so that's all from me. And uh, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Ankita. So I, I think we have a bit of time for questions now. If anyone has any, um, feel free to put them in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and, and ask. Mm, okay, so I, I actually have a question, Ankita. So um, it, it seems like uh, the whole Stripe.js um, library has quite a bit of complexity to it. So I, I just wanted to know um, sort of how long it has been in the building to get to this point. Yeah, I think uh, it has been very iterative. I would say that uh, it's probably been in the building for maybe close to like, I actually don't know exactly the timeline, but I do know that about two years ago, it had a uh, mainly just a credit card element and also a bunch of like other uh not so much of the ui elements but uh javascript essentially like it's like a javascript library where you can call some of stripe's apis by if you were making a node.js integration for example you could basically use stripe.js to uh not uh, you yeah you could use stripe's javascript libraries to call into stripe's apis uh so i would say that it's still in the order of like a couple of years right like say four years five years roughly okay. about there Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, so I guess if not, uh, thank you so much to Ankita and also um, I see Sarah here. So thank you so much to both Ankita and Sarah for coming down and speaking us, uh, to us today. So um, I mean, I, I think especially for me, like uh, I, I do quite a bit of front end. Uh, and I think the running joke in, in the front-end community is always, you know, when, when Stripe releases a new landing page, everyone races to go and inspect Element on, on, and figure out how, to, how things are built. So, um, yeah, I think it was very nice to hear from you guys on uh, how things work under the hood and how things are built. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for joining, I guess. Yeah, um, okay. So, I think now we'll be going for a short break, um, probably about five minutes. So, we'll come back at... 7.57 um, for our second talk. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, hi everyone. Thanks for staying for the second talk. Uh, for the second talk, we have Joel, uh, and he's a master's student in statistics in, at NES. Uh, he was previously a member of NES Hackers as well, uh, and he is an avid user of Python. He's been learning Spanish for 150 days. Uh, he also enjoys functional languages like Elixir. Yeah, and he'll be he'll be talking about C Python internals, and C Python is, if I'm not wrong, it's the most commonly used version or implementation of Python. So yeah, Joel, over to you. Let me stop sharing my screen. Ooh, thanks, uh, Shaitanya, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, just give me a moment. Uh, right. So yeah, as as Chaitanya uh, rightly mentioned, I'll be talking about C Python today. It is, uh, to my knowledge, the most widely used uh, version. Of Python because it's a reference implementation. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen. Uh, by the way, uh, Joel, do you mind if people stop you? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, so I think what I have here is a very loose structure. So feel free to stop me anytime, and we can probably discuss uh, either the code or anything else. 
Um, yeah, but for the compiler wizards in this talk, uh, this isn't going to be really in depth. How oh, is not here, right? So, oh uh, yeah, it's well, not not that it's not in depth per se, but we'll start from the ground up. It's meant to be entry level. Uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah. So thanks. Uh, hmm, thanks. Yeah, I'll be talking about compiler internals of not compiler internals, C Python internals today, um, and just a brief intro about myself. So uh, yeah, I used to be from SOC. Uh, so I did a uh, bachelor's there, uh, bachelor degree, got out, and then uh, then COVID kicked in, kicked in. So I went to do a master's. Um, after doing a master's, uh, decided you know it's not not that useful. Plus a bunch of other opportunities came up. So I will probably be taking an LOA. Um, so for this talk, uh, I'll be assuming an understanding. Uh, of Python and some C. Uh, no worries for the unique features of Python. I'll probably take walk you through. Uh, as for C, uh, nothing beyond the level of 2100 will be needed. Uh, and this, this is not an advanced talk. So uh, I'll walk through sections of the code. Uh, there'll be no in-depth uh, portions of uh, which require understanding of the compilers. For instance, I won't be talking about things like uh, interning, um, not, not, not like as a student, but uh, in the compiler, uh, things like uh, compiler optimizations. Um, no, uh, we'll start from ground up. Right, so what we'll be doing is we'll be doing a walkthrough of uh, what happens when you type something simple into, uh, you know, <coughs> when you try and uh, run a, a simple program in Python. And after that, we'll talk about some basic features uh, and how they're implemented under the hood. So that would be things like the global interpreter log, things like uh, iterators and um, and a bit of memory management as well. So if, if we have time, uh, we'll probably dive into the code or if we run through this uh, short presentation too fast, we'll run into the code as well. Yeah, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Okay, so uh, before that, right, um, let, let's first introduce what is C Python per se and actually why should you care about uh, C Python at all? So uh, C Python is actually, so. Python is actually a specification rather than it's a language, and then it's defined by some specifications. So there's many ways that it could actually be implemented. C Python is the reference implementation. It's implemented in C, so that means uh, all all the uh, Python that you get you write uh, gets compiled by uh, something that's written in C, and then um, yeah. But of course, you could do the same with um, other languages. So we have Jiten, which is the uh, Java version of the interpreter, uh, and we have PyPy, which is written in Python, and then uh, Cyton, which is a superset of uh, Python. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, derivatives of um, uh, other language, other implementations of Python in other languages, like uh, Rust Python, but uh, those aren't as common. So uh, for today, we'll just be looking at C Python. Next slide. Uh, so just a high level overview of what exactly C Python is. So if you go to the uh, GitHub page for uh, CPython, you'll find that um, after you clone the repo, you'll find four main uh, folders. You don't actually need to look inside the folders because I'll walk you through them. But uh, here, I'm just giving you a high level overview. So there's include, which are all the .h header files where all the interfaces are defined. So this, this will be all your, um, your, yeah, all your header files, basically. And then you have objects, which represent the various type of uh, Python objects. So like float objects, dictionary objects. And we'll cover a bit on um, how and why, like how, how these objects are implemented. Um, and then we have, of course, have uh, Python, which, which has the main runtime. And uh, we have the grammar, which is the uh, section you edit if you want to um, you know, make the language creator leave. So like recently, there's a bit of a controversy because uh, a, uh, operator in was introduced the walrus operator uh, um, which uh, resulted in yeah so, so which resulted in great controversy and uh, the BFDL um, the creator of language uh, leaving well not not the, not the creator the maintainer yeah but anyway uh, so now we're gonna walk through what happens when you run a simple program like uh, this this little uh, slide over here right so let's say it's just a program it just prints a string statement. Um, so when, when you actually run this uh, statement, right? So there are a few steps and we're gonna explain what each step uh, looks like, what happens within each step, the outputs between each step. Uh, I'll give like examples of what they look like. And um, yeah, we for, for the purposes of this talk, we won't 
dive into um, how errors are handled in between. We won't talk about exceptions. Uh, we'll just talk about the very high level uh, details about uh, each and every stage. Yeah, so the reader is what um, takes in the, the uh, program per se and then uh, lexes it after. Okay, so uh, at a very high level, this is what happens when you run um, Python um, test or Py, Python tree test or Py. Um, so if it is a script file, which is our third case, because it's test of pi, uh, you'll run pi run file xbx. You don't need to know what this is, but I'm just giving you a rough overview. If it's a block PYC file, you have one path. And um, if it's from standard input, meaning you say you do Python dash C, you have a third output. This is just to give you an overview. Don't worry, you have no idea what uh, these, um, these uh, functions are. Right? Okay, so then after that, uh, it gets tokenized by the vector. So you have, uh, you can do this, you can simulate this by running python m tokenize e token.py. And this, this will break down the, uh, the original uh, source code into tokens. So you can read this in the following manner. Uh, in the first column, you have uh, where the uh, uh, tokens are located originally, the rough region. Uh, B is what the tokens mean, and uh, C is uh, well, each of the, um, the actual token. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then so D D dent is uh, included at the very end of, of each uh, function, and then you have an end marker at the very end as well. Okay, so then we go from the lexer to the parser. So in order to get this uh, pass tree, uh, what you can probably do is you know just take a code string and then you pass it. Uh, there's a direct entry point. Um, so after passing it, you get something like this. So uh, this is not very human readable. Um, but you can actually <coughs> go through the tree and modify it. I did not include the source code here, but uh, you can, yeah, anyway. So yeah, this from Dexter to parser. Okay, and then uh, you have from parser to compiler. So this is what the, uh, the final uh, ESD could look like when you pass it into a visualizer. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then from the uh, compiler, you will generate a control slow graph, uh, which is not represented here, but it's basically a, um, Graph, yeah, which you can then use to generate a uh, bytecode. Um, yeah, so that's, that's for the first part. So you now have a very high level overview. <coughs> so yeah, as I mentioned, uh, after generating the EST, you can walk through the EST using a depth first search and convert um, it into a control flow graph and the control flow graph um, can then be converted into bytecode. Right, uh, so other details. Uh, so typically, while after, while after generating the EST, uh, you would also need uh, some, apart from storing the AST, some compiler state, you would also need a, to generate a simple table. The simple table actually contains um, the various uh, namespaces and the, uh, of the uh, entire program, uh, the um, <coughs> both local and global namespaces. Um, yeah, and, and just basically where, where each, um, variable is, is, is contained um, and which, which scope it is in, yeah. Okay, so this is a simple table. Yeah, and then, so if you want something that is quick and end-to-end, -end, uh, you can do something like compile an arbitrary, st arbitrary statement, uh, and then you have a file name, and then you just evaluate, and then you get the code. The byte code is just given over here. Yeah, so that's what the output will look like. Uh, and, but, well, of course, you probably want uh, it in a more human-readable format. So if you, you can use another tool called the disassembler, which uh, breaks it down into instructions. So if you import this, DIS, not THIS, and do you do this dot this on the code section, you actually get something that looks like uh, this over here. So let me break down how to read this. On the leftmost column, we have the uh, line number. Uh, and then you have the uh, byte offsets together with the instructions. Then on the rightmost column, you have the um, the variable itself, and then the uh, uh, index reference. Uh, sorry, the internal uh, uh, referencing. Yeah. So like the the this is metadata for the the uh, interpreter to keep track of where each variable is located. Yeah, you can think of it that way. Okay. So then there's a return value here, and you have zero none. Uh, yeah. So this is no. So far. Yeah, there's actually a question on the chat. Sure. What is the question? Uh, what does it mean? So Julius, uh, Julius is asking, 
what does it mean for a symbol to be local versus global? Are only symbols and functions local? Oh, hang on. Let me try and get back to my screen. And then let me read the question. Sorry, what? Oh, let me try and read the question again. What does it mean for, if I were to rephrase your question, uh, did he say, what does it mean for a symbol to be local versus global? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, yeah, so like uh, you have the notion of scopes, right? So um, Python is lexically scopes, meaning that uh, after like passing the entire code, you can tell uh, just based on the code where each and every uh, variable is. Like. So let's say if we have something like uh, a variable in def show table, right? So then if, it is, if the variable is defined, if we have a variable A and it's defined within this scope, then it is within the scope of table. But if it's in a global scope, uh, if it's defined outside over here, like a equals to four, then it will be in the global scope. Yeah, because functions have their own scopes, and then you your uh, then you have things in the global scope. Yeah, so that's what it would mean for something to be local within a function, uh, or like just global in the global environment. Does that answer your question? Let me see the chat. Uh, how do I read the table on the left? Okay, so you have um, the name of the variable, whether or not it's uh, local or global, whether or not it's global. And uh, this rightmost column, uh, whether there are any local variables. So in this case, there are no local variables. So uh, nothing's inside. Apologies, I didn't include the program that I used to generate this, but yeah. Uh, in this program, it's just a, uh, yeah. It was just an if statement, if else statement, uh, with, uh, yeah, in the in the within the function, I believe I can pull it up later. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Yeah, sorry. Uh, stop. Please stop me. Uh, yeah. So that that's the simple table, um, and this is the compilation, and uh, this is the uh, bytecode uh, and the instructions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing to note, right, about um, uh, C Python is that uh, if you don't add a return statement, then uh, automatically a, a none will be returned at the very end. So that's why you see this uh, load constant zero none. Uh, it's not that clear because I didn't provide the code over here, but uh, in the later code examples, you will probably uh, see that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, after that, right, um, what happens after you get the uh, list of instructions is that uh, it goes through this huge thing called the uh, C eval loop. So what that basically does is, um, so all these instructions here, uh, based on the instructions, you will push things onto a value stack, uh, which, uh, which, which is basically a stack which contains uh, various intermediate values. You can push onto the stack, out from the stack, and then uh, if you do certain operations, you take certain op uh, values off the stack and push them back on. Yeah, so that's the value stack. Um, and um, yeah, using the value stack as well as uh, the instructions here, uh, we go through an entire loop, uh, the C eval loop, which goes through all the instructions. So it's basically this large for loop, which I'll show in a bit, uh, which is for this opcode, uh, do the certain do a certain set of instructions, uh, check if the GIL is held, and then you know, um, either look for the next opcode, uh, which is and either do a dispatch or a fast dispatch. Uh, fast dispatch just means that you jump directly to the next opcode immediately. Dispatch means you go back to the very start of the switch loop and then you check again. Uh, what is an opcode, right? So uh, an opcode is basically uh, one of uh, these over here. Yeah. So like load fast, load const, uh, load slice, binary sub, uh, sub SCR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Probably not very clear. Yeah, so this is the uh, example of what the C eval, uh, C eval dot C loop uh, looks like. So um, based on the opcode, uh, you will do certain uh, operations. So here we have uh, load const store fast um, and load fast. Let me see if, uh, yeah, so you see load fast and then uh, here would be load fast. Yeah, so based on each opcode, right? Uh, each opcode will have a relevant set of uh, uh, instructions to, to execute based on, on what you get from uh, which opcode you get. Yeah. And uh, 
we'll, we'll walk through some of these, what some of these instructions mean in a bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but before that, right, we noticed that there's this, um, this portion over here, this pi object thing, which uh, we like, yeah, which, which, which um, you may or may not have seen before. Uh, so I'm just going to walk through what exactly is a pi object because a pi object is, is at the uh, center of the entire um, uh, Python uh, ecosystem. So like everything, everything is a pi object. So like uh, if you go into your console, right, and then you type uh, dir on uh, any any item, any uh, string, uh, number, um, yeah, anything really, uh, you probably get an object. So like uh, you probably get a list of methods, and these are methods which are defined on an object, um, a pi object rather. Um, so a pi object can be thought of as uh, a box. So like uh, if you think back to programming 101, they always tell you that um, you know everything is encapsulated in a box. Boxes have values uh, and you can take things out of the box. Uh, to a certain extent in Python, uh, this is true. Everything is a box. So like uh, let's say I have a, a float then the box will be a float pi object. Uh, let's say I have an int, then it'll be an int pi object. And in order to perform operations on uh, various boxes, like say I want to do an add uh, one plus two, what actually happens under the hood is uh, one is taken out from this box, two is taken out from this box, the values are added together, and then they are put in a new box and then uh, you know returned to the environment. Yeah, uh, I'll go through that in a bit. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, this is just a slide about the pi object. So this is actually what the pi object looks like under the hood. So uh, with Python, right? So you notice that Python, uh, C Python is implemented in C. So uh, naturally that may, may raise the question for some of you, uh, how do I implement, um, say something like uh, inheritance in, uh, in, in C? Because uh, if you think about it, you have pi objects, right? And then you have int pi objects, pi int objects, and you have pi float objects, and you have pi many, many things objects, ticked objects. Uh, it seems like you, you would uh, want some sort of uh, inheritance uh, in, in, the, in the system. So, uh, but this is C, so we don't, have, we don't have OOP. So does anyone want to give a guess uh, how, how uh, you know, we, we might implement inheritance with, uh, with C? Yeah, just, in, just a rough guess. Okay, so uh, if it's not, no worries, I'll go through that. So um, actually what is done over here, right, is uh, we, sorry, my mom's, uh, yeah, so C, C Python, um, in C Python, right, what, what you actually do is you implement uh, structural subtyping. So what this means is that um, in, for every pi object, uh, the structure is the same. You have, um, you have a head extra, uh, you have a fixed structure at the very start. You have a head extra, maybe ref count and object type, and the ref count and object type Will always be located in the first two fields. So if you go to a pi object, if you go to a pi float object, uh, you will always be ensured that you know uh, the uh, type is probably in the first position and the ref count or let's say the the uh, the type is in, in the second position. Another thing to note is that uh, the, the pi type object is, is itself an object. Yeah, and that gives you a bunch of useful information like whether or not it's iterable. Uh, and a few other properties, yeah. And the hit contains uh, some metadata, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is what a pi float object would look like. So just now, as I mentioned, it implements a uh, structural subtyping. So you will have, uh, you always have the hit so that you can reference it at, uh, you know, the same location every time. Okay, so uh, now I'll move on to talk about memory management. So uh, if, I'm gonna ask everyone to, sorry, apologies, I need to probably change my location. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, um, 
Yeah, where was I? So, so that was about Pi objects. So now I'm going to talk about uh, memory management in Python. So uh, memory management in Python is done in a couple of layers. So you have um, memory management at the hardware level, the operating system level, or at the Python interpreter level. So uh, we're going to talk about what is done at the uh, Python interpreter level. So uh, more specifically, um, yeah, so, so how, how this actually works is if there's anything larger than 512 kilobytes, uh, then Python will say, you know, uh, system handle it for me. I, I, don't, I don't want any business with this. But it's, uh, if it's under 512 bytes, uh, kilobytes rather, um, Python will actually, uh, Python actually has a, a system, uh, like building memory allocator to handle uh, requests under 512 kilobytes. So it's separated into blocks, pools, and arenas. So blocks are the basic unit, it's about like uh, one byte or so. Um, and then you have pools which are composed of blocks. Um, pools are about four kilobytes. And then you have arenas which consists of uh, multiple pools. Uh, due to time constraints, uh, I think I probably will not go through the, the or I probably can cover this part. So as I mentioned, you have arenas which are 256 kilobytes and you have uh, pools which are four kilobytes and you have blocks which are uh, one byte or so, and um, yeah, pools, uh, pools, arenas, and blocks uh, can all have one of either three states. They are either free, uh, uh, used, or full. So uh, free meaning that you know uh, they're completely unoccupied. Uh, in the case of a pool, uh, used meaning that you know they are occupied, some are occupied but not fully filled. And then uh, full meaning, you know, it's completely exhausted. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a rough structure of what blocks look like. So then um, you have a free block pointer, which will point to the first free block. And um, yeah, as and when you are required to, you know, um, uh, move <coughs> or request for a uh, new memory, uh, you would either advance the pointer or first first check if you know there's free memory. Um, yeah, so the, the free block will always point to the the first available memory segment, I believe. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, just now as mentioned, uh, requests are handled in tiers. So up to 512 uh, um, kilobytes, yeah, in intervals of eight. Um, so then you have uh, different sizes of allocated blocks. And yeah, so, so from zero to 512 and above 512, it's just run routed to the underlying uh, system allocator uh, and it's handled there. Okay, so um, now we talk about the garbage collection in Python. So actually in, uh, in Python, garbage collection is done by reference counting. What that means is uh, whenever you do an assignment to an object, say uh, you do something like um, let me just draw x equals to five, or like uh, something like a equals to b. Perhaps this will be uh, clearer. This means that uh, you know uh, the value of b is, is is now assigned to to a. So this means that a actually if it's, is by reference, then a actually points to b. And then B is actually referenced by A. So that this means that the reference count of B increases. Uh, so if whenever A is uh, deleted, then the reference count will go down. And when the reference count drops to zero, uh, it is garbage collected. So uh, garbage collected meaning that uh, it is the memory region that uh, the, uh, the object applies, uh, obtains uh, that the object um, Holes is reclaimed, yeah. So anyway, so in this example, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just curious. So in that case, how does the GC handle uh, reference cycles? Oh, I'm gonna cover that in the okay. subsequent oh, yeah. slides. Yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah. So um, yeah. So then in this case, right, we have a case where you know the local namespace uh points to a one, the local namespace points to a two, and then uh a two points to a one, and then a one points to uh a2. Yeah, so uh, if you are noticing this uh, quite carefully, you notice that uh, there's actually, you know, a reference cycle in that, you know, if um, the local namespace 
if this, this reference from the local namespace is deleted and this reference from the local namespace is deleted, A2 is still referencing A1 and A1 is still referencing A2. So uh, even though they don't belong in the local namespace anymore, uh, they still have references to them. So they're not garbage collected. Right, so uh, as just mentioned, uh, the local namespace uh, pointers are deleted, so they no longer exist in the environment, but um, uh, you know, they're not garbage collected yet because they, they still reference each other. They still have each other. Yeah, so um, what, what happens in Python is that uh, they actually have this thing called generational reference counting. So what it basically means is that uh, objects are created in generations and um, at each generation, right, uh, if, if you are not, if you don't have a, uh, if you're not garbage collected, uh, you're moved to the next generation. Yeah. And um, so Python, the Python, C Python implementation has up to three generations. And uh, once you reach the cross third generation, uh, you're just garbage collected. So this gets around uh, reference, um, this gets around reference cycles because beyond a certain um, generation, you're just garbage collected. <laughs> okay, so then uh, this is the GIL. Um, so the GIL refers to the global interpreter log in Python. So um, you may have heard like, so what the significance of the GIL is that, you know, whenever you run Python code, uh, you can at max only run a, a single thread. Yeah, so like um, this limits performance heavily. And this this is an implementation detail of uh, C Python. Um, yeah, if you run something like Jython or you run something like uh, Rust Python, you won't uh, face such an issue. And what the GIL, uh, actually is, 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 it is just a, um, uh, it's just a Boolean variable, uh, which is controlled by a mutex and a conditional variable. So like, let's say we have two threads over here, right? One is running. In order for thread two to run, uh, thread one must release the GIL. And um, in order for thread two to, so thread two is currently blocked uh, by thread one. So in order for thread two to request for, the GIL from thread one, it needs to create a GIL drop request and then um, wait for a while and then acquire the GIL, then continue running. Yep. Uh, so how this, this GIL is actually implemented is, you know, uh, like I mentioned, it's just this um, GIL lock. It's just a Boolean variable, which can be set to zero or one. So if it's a, if it's a one that is locked, then if zero is it's not locked. Yeah, so then you would then acquire the GIL in, in order to run. And uh, you notice that there's also a default interval for, for the GIL before it's, it uh, times out. And uh, this can be set over here as well. Uh, you can do it by importing this and setting the default interval. Okay, so then now we talk about iterators. Uh, so like, um, so for iterators, right, in Python, uh, what's the GIL for? Okay, so, Yes, good point. Uh, so the GIL exists because you know it's not safe for um, <coughs> for Python to to multi threaded um, <coughs> to run multiple interpreters at the same time. So therefore, uh, due to this uh, implementation, the implementation of C Python, the GIL exists so that yeah, I guess that that is also true. Just to ignore Python devs want to multi threading. So. Um, yeah, so, so in order to ensure that, you know, there's safe behavior, uh, the GIL ensures that, you know, only uh, one, one track can run at any point in time. So the, the interpretation is, is safe, yeah. Oh, sorry, just a quick question. Um, I wonder, uh, uh, can you go back to the previous page? Yeah. Um, so let's see uh, if during uh, thread two is suspended and waiting uh, before it, uh, in, issue that uh, request, right? the yep. GIL job request. Then uh, let's see thread one uh, happens to suspend itself, for example, to wait for some IO, uh, mm -hmm. then what will happen? So will, will thread two start to run earlier than this timeout or will another thread uh, come? So ah, what okay. will happen in this case? Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Uh, the answer to that is, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not too sure. I would think um, thread two would probably run, but but you are right in that uh, you know the the thread which uh, signals the drop request doesn't isn't always the the thread isn't always the thread that you know gets to run. Uh, so I would think 
probably thread two will run, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, Sean mentions, uh, it depends on what it's called. Yeah, that's probably right as well, probably right as well. I, again, I, I don't have a concrete answer. I'm not very sure, but uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's a good point we raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, about the GIL. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is iterators. So if you break down the iterator, right, uh, the iterator basically com consists of, um, no, sorry, let's back up one step. So <coughs> just to recall what an iterator is, so if I do for i in range 1000, uh, basically what that means is it'll go uh, from 1 to 1000, and then at every step, uh, it'll, it'll run uh, one iteration of the loop, and um, it would assign like the value, the i, the value of i gets set to the the value in the iteration. Now. So if, if it's uh, if you're on the first iteration, then i becomes one, second iteration, i becomes two. And uh, this is reflected when we break down the byte code and we see that you know uh, we do a get iteration, uh, for iter, and then we store the name. We'll break down what get iter and for iter do exactly. Okay, so uh, first we have get iter. Okay, so <coughs> what, what get iter actually do, does is um, it gets the iterable off the top of the stack um, and then it runs, you know, um, get iter and then dec decrements the, the reference counter on, on, on the uh, iterable. So we go through what get iter does. <coughs> right, so um, yeah, so as you can see, we have. Um, the get iter function uh, and a, the, on the type object, we have tp iter, uh, which is basically like a <coughs> function to help with iteration. So we see that uh, if, if we don't have f, we need to create a new iterable on a sequence, right? Uh, if not, we can just use the iterable. So let's look at what uh, you know this iterable does for us, this sequence iter does for us. Excuse me, yeah. So within a uh, sequence iter, right, um, the main part is, we are, <coughs> the main part is over here. So we see that the iterator has a start index and um, <coughs> the, uh, sorry, let me, hold on. Yeah, an index and then the, the iterator sequence. So this allows you to track uh, where the, the current index is and if I recall correctly, where the limit is for the sequence iterator, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, so so by using this, you can tell whether or not you hit the end of um, the iterable, yeah. Okay, and then this is used to create the iterable type. Um, oops, sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah. So sorry. So then after doing the the uh, get iter object and creating a new iterable. Uh, then we have the next step, right? Which is uh, what happens uh, within the iteration uh, loop. So within for iter, right? So uh, within for iter, what happens is um, we actually get the the uh, top of the value stack, and then we call um, we call this function um, tp next iter on um, the iterable, which is currently at the top of the value stack, uh, which, which was the stack that uh, we stored all the values we mentioned just now. So when we call this function, right, it actually uh, advances to the next step. We'll probably give an overview of what uh, TP next iter is in the sub subsequent slides. So yeah, uh, and then, you know, if next is not now, then we will just uh, continue on with the standard procedure. But uh, yeah, so this is what um, the, uh, the next next iter would probably do. This is distinct from uh, this TP is the next. So yeah, so during this iteration process, it just checks if you know the sequence is uh, now or we have overflow. Uh, if not, then we'll get the next item. So like um, we call get item on C and uh, IT to IT next. I may have a slide describing this the next slide. Uh, Okay, do not, yeah. And then, um, yeah, but basically this just gets you the item uh, based on, you know, the, the index, the current index that we are at. And, you know, if, if there is no item, uh, if, if there is an item, 
then we just increment the IT IT index pointer and return what we have. Else, if we have exception, we have, we escape. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically how an iterable is implemented at a very high level, just with the IT index ITC. Yeah. Uh, so then this uh, last part, I'm just going to talk about the um, how we can use the uh, the opcodes uh, to make sense of the differences between uh, these two um, segments of, of code over here. Right. So on the left, we have the uh, top example, and on the right, we have the uh, bottom example. So the, the top example is a copy, whereas the right the bottom example is just a assignment. Uh, so in the uh, bottom example, we can see that you know we're just loading B, and then we're storing it to A, and then we're just returning. Because over here, we see that there's no re return statement. So by default, uh, uh, the uh, uh, CPython uh, interpreter just returns none. Yeah. So then uh, we have that. Whereas uh, in the top example, we are loading uh, B, and then we again load two constants. So these two constants are for the binary sub, uh, S sub subscription data. So what that actually does is uh, it actually takes, after getting the, the slice, form some operations, and then you store it back, and then um, yeah, you load the constants back. So you can see that. Uh, this portion over here is uh, distinct from this portion over here in that you know there's a slice generated here and a shadow copy is done. Um, I realized I didn't give a very convincing explanation of this. Um, you can probably look at the docs. I don't actually remember. Um, yeah. <coughs> and then this is what a list compilation will look like. So um, again, you can see with the bytecode, uh, you would probably build a list load, and then you would again iterate through uh, two times. So then you would store load, is, uh, and then just append, jump, store load. It's, it's like a regular, it seems like a regular for loop. Yeah, it's just, yeah, not too far from a regular for loop. OK, so uh, resources that you can read from here, probably this is what uh, I actually have been digging around for the past few days. Uh, Mainly, um, there's a new parser being released for Python 3.9. Uh, there's a series of posts um, about the PEG parser. Uh, there's Fluent Python, which is a famous book. And then uh, there are a couple of PyCon talks about bytecode. And the C Python contribution guide is actually quite comprehensive. Uh, that's actually where I got most of the information for, from. Um, yeah, and there's a 10 hour video session by. Um, one of the uh, contributors uh, to C Python. Okay, so then these are some references, uh, and yeah, some uh, thanks to various people who helped arrange this talk. Uh, probably, yeah, I realized I might have rushed through that bit too fast. Uh, so probably we can go back and talk about uh, various segments of the the uh, presentation if needed. Yeah, and maybe come back to this question as well. Uh, thanks, Joel. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Like Joel said, I mean, he's willing to go into details. So feel free to ask questions. Mm. Yeah, are there any questions? You can type it down in the chat. Okay. Uh, eh, I don't think there are any any more questions so in that case thanks joel thanks for speaking uh if you don't mind stopping your screen share i want to share something else sure sure cool thanks yeah uh so to whoever asked the uh question about this i'll probably get back to you if you leave your name in the chat or just message me yeah Uh, okay, thanks everyone for attending today's Friday hack session. Uh, it would be great if you can provide us feedback because this is the first semester we're doing it online and we can really, it'll really help if you provide us some feedback on how we can improve or if there's some speakers you're looking, some kind of speakers or some, some particular content you want to be covered in Friday hacks. 
just wait for you to get your feedback. I think it will really help us. Yeah. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, feel free to exit the meeting if yeah, if you want to. Uh, thanks. Please remember to give feedback. What's next week's talk? Uh, next week, no talk. Sorry? And next week, no Friday hack. Oh, no Friday hack. Sorry, right, right, right. yeah. There's one two weeks late. Oh, like next to next week. So there's Talpius and Zendes. Ah, I see. Yeah. How's the undergrad life? Oh, wait, is the recording over? Yeah. What? <laughs> Is the recording over? Oh, it's 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 not. Uh, so let me stop.